with me to look at the U.S., uh, but also at markets and economies overseas is Nero Rubini. He's the co-founder and chairman of investment and risk management firm Rubini Global Economics. Also with me is Bloomberg's economist Josh Wright. Guys, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Nuri, let's start with you because there are some things that we seem to be certain about, right? We seem to be almost certain that the Fed is going to end their QE program. What's up in the air is when they're going to raise interest rates. And I'm wondering with the recent choppy economic data that we have gotten, Nuriel, does that justify a view that interest rates are going to take longer to rise than what the Fed is saying? Uh, yes, I think that the Fed wants to avoid the situation which there'll be lift off and they have to abort the lift off. So there's an option value waiting the way they put it to me. So suppose that by middle of next year, growth, unemployment, inflation are such that you should start the hike, but the uncertainties from the dollar of the world is better to wait another six weeks or 12 weeks because there is an option value waiting. The worst thing that the Fed could do is start the lift off, stop it and abort it. Like right. it happened and they, and they in the yeah. country because you're going to lose its credibility and you have a risk of a hard landing. So everything else equal, even if the economy is ready, they're going to wait another six weeks or 12 weeks. That means that maybe if the decision should be made in June, it's going to come in July or in September. But Nuriel, six, 12 weeks, that doesn't sound like a yeah. whole lot of time, right? Yeah. But what if we're talking about six months? 12 months, then do we get into a danger zone at all? Well, uh, to wait six or 12 months means that the economy is really weakening significantly in a way in which now the markets are pricing and the Fed exiting only towards the end of next year. I think it's going to be still the middle of next year, maybe tilted toward Q3 rather than Q2 right now. Okay. But of course, if the global uh, essentially headwinds that are coming from Eurozone, from Japan, from China, from emerging market, from the further here. strengthening of the U.S. dollar, or there's been also some domestic data like retail spending, right. the, uh, the durable spending orders. So if the world is affecting the U.S. in a way that makes the outlook for growth inflation much worse than the Fed is expecting right now, they've already said the decision is essentially state dependent, data dependent. They're going to decide when to lift off and how fast, yeah. depending on the data. It's not anymore lower for longer, unconditional is a state contingent policy. Uh, Josh, I know you've written some pieces here at Bloomberg where you say there is a risk that the Fed is perhaps focused too much, though, on the inflation numbers, too much on low inflation. Well, there's been some controversy in, in recent weeks where we had St. Louis Fed President Bullard come out and say because of the decline in inflation expectations, right. maybe the Fed should keep buying assets or you know, be prepared to increase um, the asset purchases in the future. That doesn't look like it, it's so likely uh, at this point. Uh, I think that the Fed is really no, going to No, it seemed like that, cho that choppiness we had, that volatility, is pretty much It's done. bounced right back. Yeah. It's, uh, I, and I think that's a testament to some of the other people in the Fed who've been saying, we've got to see a real trend establish itself before we're going to take further action. Because remember, you know, Ben Bernanke made his name on the reaction to the crisis. Janet Yellen is going to make her name on how she pulls us out of the world of unconventional monetary policy and brings us back to a world of conventional monetary policy. And that means rates, that means data, that means trends, that means slow and steady and fewer headlines. Would you agree with that, Nouriel? That's how she's going to make her name? Yeah, the key thing for Janet Yellen is essentially to manage the exit from unconventional monetary policy, right. initially zero policy rates, quantitative easing, credit easing, forward guidance. Uh, the end of QE is going to be today. Even if the economy really weakens severely, you cannot rule out that there'll be QE4 at some point down the line. I mean, San Francisco Fed uh, Williams has said that maybe we'll need uh, QE4. Now, that's not my baseline scenario. I don't think that's likely. I think that what's going to happen is you end QE, and then the question is when you start lifting rates, and that could be pushed further in the future, depending on the data. The key thing is that the data right now are the key things. There is not any more unconditional forward guidance. Yeah. It's going to be essentially policy reaction depends on growth, unemployment, inflation, and also global headwinds and the dollar. Nuriel, haven't you said, though, that the longer we wait between the end of QE3 and the beginning of raising interest rates, that the longer that time period is, the more risk we're going to see some sort of credit bubble, right? Yes, my, my worry is that the real economy justifies a very slow exit, but all this liquidity has gone not in the credit in the real economy, but in asset reflation. Right. Asset reflation becomes asset fraudiness, and eventually asset fraudiness can become asset and credit risk? bubble. I think that, you know, suppose even the Fed does what they are planning to do, zero now and be around 2% at the end of 16, that is what the dot's saying. Yeah. There's already massive releveraging of the corporate sector of the financial system outside of the banks, and we're in a situation which last year, junk bond issuance was at the 2007 high. Cov light, pick toggle, lots of rottenness. Another two years of this, even with zero rate going to 2%, implied that that credit bubble mm -hmm. could really be significant, not today, but two years from so now. So even a baseline scenario. Yeah. Anuriel, you agree with this, that we're still on very fragile territory here in the U.S.? 
Uh, I would say it's a fragile territory for the global economy. There are essentially four engines of the global economic airplane, United States, Eurozone, Japan, and China mm -hmm. and emerging markets. The only engine is really working for now is the U.S. slash the United Kingdom. Uh, Eurozone is stalling. They're one shock away from deflation and double deep recession. Uh, Japan is slowing down sharply after the consumption tax increase in Q2. Q3 right. doesn't look very good, and they want to do it again next year, and that's going to be probably a policy mistake. And China? And, and China is in a structural slowdown. I think Chinese growth is going to be below 6% by 2000. And, uh, 16. So we have essentially three engines of global growth that are sputtering or stalling, while the U.S. So, so far is decoupling. It can decouple only as long as global economic growth doesn't get even worse and as long as the dollar doesn't keep on appreciating. Right. So the more is stronger is the dollar and the weaker is global growth, the more the transmission to trade but also financial channels could become more important even for the United States. Well, so far, to your point, Nuri, I mean, we've been buffered here in the U.S., right, from yeah. some of these headwinds overseas. Yeah. You see the biggest downside risk, though, overseas is going to be in Europe. Is that right? Uh, certainly, Europe looks like particularly fragile right now. And okay. what's happening both in Europe and Japan is that not only there are downside risks to economic growth and inflation, but there is also policy inertia. The ECB should be going into QE. They're not going to do it until next year. The Bank of Japan should be doing top-up QE this year on the top of what they've already done. They've not done it so far. And fiscal policy is becoming increasingly contractionary in the case of Japan. First uh, hike in taxes, second one next year. And in the Eurozone, there is not the fiscal stimulus that Draghi, the IMF, and the U.S. Treasury telling Germany you should do. Because even Germany is the growth is stalling right now. Right. So you need a fiscal stimulus in Germany and the Eurozone. You need monetary easing and there is policy inertia. So bad economic news are now bad for the markets because there is the effects of this bad economic news and there is inertia on the policy side in Europe and Japan. But, Nero, but Japan, though, has been kind of a, a non-player in all of this <laughs> already. I mean, they've been kind of DOA for several, several years. I mean, uh, do we even need a, a Japan to be an engine, a part of this global growth story to get liftoff? Well, uh, Japan has been stagnating for almost 20 years, but first of all, if Abenomics were to fail, you could eventually in the next five years have a debt crisis in Japan. Secondly, Japan is still yeah. the third largest economy in the world after the United States and China. So what happens in Japan to trade channel matters, for example, for Asian growth. So I would not discount that weakness of Japan is one of the additional factors that can also lead to weakness of the global economy. And by the way, Japanese weakness implies a weaker yen. Yeah. That's a bigger than ever towards China, towards Asia, towards the rest of the world. And weakness in the Eurozone means a weaker euro. So we are back in a situation which everybody is trying to stimulate net exports because their domestic demand is fragile. Yeah. You have new rounds of quantitative easing going to lead to currency tensions across the but, world. Nuriel, I mean, Europe is clearly fragile and uh, could go one way or the other, really, at this point. But we just had the European uh, bank stress tests over the weekend, yeah. and they clearly show that it seems like the financial system has recapitalized well uh, and that they are far better off than they were uh, six years ago. Isn't well, that a positive? Uh, uh, couple of caveats. First of all, those measures don't control for a risk scenario of outright deflation. The downside scenario and the stress as was inflation at 1% is already at 0.3 right now, could be a zero in two months. Secondly, there are all these deferred tax assets that have been used as a fudge in Italy, Spain, Portugal and Greece to boost the capital of the banks. And that's a problem in terms of measuring their capital. And third, the most important point is that in the Eurozone right now, there is not a problem of credit supply. Banks now are going to have capital, they have liquidity, there is credit easing. There's an issue of credit demand because if the economy is not growing, mm -hmm. the firms are not going to even borrow cheap zero rate capital to invest into new capital and into new workers. So the problem is not credit supply, it's credit demand. And credit demand depends on aggregate demand and aggregate demand depends on monetary and fiscal stimulus that is missing. So you cannot force the horse, you can bring him into the water, right. you cannot force him to drink. And I think in the situation right now, the Eurozone Bank is one in which there's not enough credit demand. It's not a credit crunch problem and like in the past. Nuriel, someone like you, you know, I listen to someone like you. Um, uh, you know, people pay attention to what to what you say. I mean, I was making a, a joke earlier that if Nuro Rabini sneezes, it's a headline. So uh, I'm always curious, sitting across from someone like you, who do you pay attention to? You know, as you're outlining for me this whole, you know, your view of the global economy, who do you pay attention to? Who do you think has it right on policy right now? 
uh, I listen and I read lots of people, especially those who disagree with me, because it's always better to figure out whether your views are right from those who don't agree with you. But let's say, you know, I follow everything that's going on. I spend about three quarters of my time traveling about around the world, throughout many continents, and leaving tonight for three weeks to Europe, Japan, China, Asia, and Latin America. So more than listening to other people's view, you want to listen to the data and what's happening in the different economies. I think spending time in each one of these countries gives you a much better sense of what's happening. Now, how about you, by the way, if I had your schedule, I, I, I'd have all gray hair and I would just be, I, your schedule is, is amazing and also quite brutal, uh, but you're in high demand, right? People want to know what, what you have to say. And you have also, of course, a lot of clients for your business. Now, here in the U.S., though, Nuriel, uh, what about the political situation? I mean, you've sounded off on what's going on in Congress. It seems like the GOP is going to win control. If all the polls are right, they're yeah. going to win control of the Senate and we could see a Republican Congress and a Democratic uh, yeah. president. So a Democratic White House. Uh, is that going to be a catalyst at all for growth here in the U.S.? Uh, I think it's going to make things worse because <clears throat> we have gridlock in the United States and more divided government is going to lead to more gridlock. Even the United States has to do structural reform because potential growth has fallen. We have to reform taxes, corporate and individual taxes. We have to do immigration reform. We have to have a sounder energy policy. We have to deal with the budget and with the debt ceiling. We have to do entitlement reform. We need lots Lots of other structural reform, like but that's investing a in infrastructure. It's a long yeah, but none of this thing is going to happen. None of this stuff is going to happen because there is going to be even more division. The Republicans, if they win the Senate, they're going to posture even more. And I'd see the next two years and a half of additional gridlock on all the fundamental issues that need to be addressed, even by the United States. And the longer we wait, the longer, the more potential growth is going to be negatively affected by the fact that even the U.S. It's not just Eurozone and Japan that have to do structural reform. We have a long list of reform we have to the United States and we've not done any of them for the if, last decade if there was one that you could pick out of that whole laundry mm -hmm. list that you just described to Muriel what would what would it be that you think could have mm -hmm. the biggest impact I would say two things one uh, immigration reform is key okay. uh, secondly of course uh, corporate tax reform as well I think among the various things those are the two most important ones uh, and uh, I know you still, you obviously have several, as I mentioned, you travel, you have your home here in the U.S. I'm just curious uh, if you soured at all living here in the U.S. Do you feel like this country is going in the wrong direction, Uriel? Well, relative to the rest of the world, we're doing better economically. I mean, we're the tallest midget in the room <laughs> by some standards. The cleanest shirt in a laundry bag that is pretty dirty. Yes, we, if you look at the rest of the world, all of so in yes. relative terms, I would say we're much better off than Europe, Japan, even many emerging markets today. But in absolute terms, I would say we have this political gridlock is not going to lead us to do the tough economic decisions on the economic reform that are necessary to put us on a higher potential growth. Are you fed growth. up? Uh, I mean, that's my question to you. Are you fed up with what's uh, going on here? I, I think that uh, there is really a problem in the U.S. of political gridlock. I would rather have a parliamentary system where whoever wins can do whatever they want for four years, like in Europe. If you do well, you get reelected. And if you don't do well, then somebody's going to replace you. In the U.S., instead, we've had divided government for the last uh, you yes. know, 10, 20 years. And it's a recipe, especially when you have to do policy changes for gridlock that is not good for the long run. Interesting parliamentary system here in the U.S. That's one. That's an idea. Nouriel, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Nouriel Rubini, the chairman of Rubini Global Economics, and as I mentioned, professor of economics at NYU Stern School of Business.